Hello, good afternoon. Um, as Wayne has kindly said, my name's Paul Andrews, and we head up this, uh, this Centre for Digital Enhanced Learning. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today really is about is a, is a suite of free tools that you can use. I'm very keen, if I'm lucky enough to be invited to talk to a group of fine and lovely people such as yourselves, that you walk out of this room with at least one thing that you might find useful that won't cost you a penny. So everything I'm going to show you today is free. In addition, uh, the presentation itself and all the web links have been uploaded to a special website. I'll give the address at the end so you don't need to make any notes if you don't want to. I'm also recording this and I've put this up with, uh, with the slides as a video. So if you want to watch it again or show it to anyone else, you, you can do that as well. Okay, um, if you have got any questions, feel free to interrupt, wave, give me a cheeky wink, whatever it is you want to do. Um, we can do it either at the end or I'm happy for people to interrupt me, it's not, not a problem at all. Um, and I, I don't know um, how familiar you are with Twitter, but if you want to send me a question via Twitter, you can do and I will get back to you um, throughout the course of today or tomorrow. So if something occurs to you, you think, oh, I want to ask him this, then, then you can do. Okay? Nods. Okay, fair enough. Right. Okay, so um, what I want to do really is I want to tell you a story about a trainer. I'm going to call this trainer called, it's not Wayne, uh, it's a, uh, this little guy, they call him Bob, Bob the trainer. And um, <clears throat> he, he, he trains staff um, left, right, and center. He's really, really busy. And he wants to use technology in some way to make his life easier and the lives of his delegates, his trainees, easier as well. So he has to think about how he might do this. And he does a bit of research, and he finds out that there are three main models when it comes to teaching and training using technology. I'm going to show you each of these three models. Each one is a progression on from the last. However, if you, if you say to yourself, oh, blimey, I'm only on the first model, that's absolutely fine. Okay? There's no, there's no, this isn't necessarily better, it's just more complex. So the first thing he could do if he wanted to, and this is what most people do when they first start thinking about using technology is they have this thing called content and support. The idea is they'll walk, walk into the training room and they'll do the business with flip charts and pens and all that cool stuff that you do. And then they might say to people, oh, by the way, uh, there's some PowerPoint presentations or there's some handouts online and you can access these whenever you like. But the idea is, and, if, and this is an insurance policy, is that if the internet broke or, or the technology failed, it wouldn't actually change what happens in the room. And this is, norm, this is the, kind of the, the normal model that most people, trainers, educators, lecturers, will, will use. And it, it is an insurance policy. So that's the first thing he, he, he might want to do. After a while, though, when people start getting comfortable with this, and, and when I say a while, it could be 12 to 18 months. It takes a little bit of time. You tend to find people then start to do what I call the sausage roll model, around at lunchtime. Um, and the, the idea is basically is that your content, your training content is here, but you surround it with digital content. And so what this might mean in practice is you might say to your delegates, right, we're going to have a, really, uh, we're gonna have a, a discussion today about a particular topic, and that discussion is really good, but you're time limited. So you can say to the delegates, you can continue this discussion if you want to online. So you can continue having that conversation. You could also flip it the other way around. You could say to people, you're going to be doing a training session with me next Tuesday, but there's some pre-course work that I want you to do, and I want you to have a group discussion. And then what you might choose to do is you might choose to pick up themes that have come out of that group discussion and talk about them when you have people face-to-face -face in the room. So, you, again, you don't have to do this, but these, these are just, this is just kind of the natural evolution. This is where it tends to go. But you tend to find there's like an osmosis or a diffusion effect of... Some things happen online, some things happen face to face. The third and final step, and this is where all the kind of the, the research has gone into kind of, people call it digitally enhanced learning or technology enhanced learning. Essentially, what you have to do is you have groups of people where they're able to choose from these different things. So people are able to choose online what kinds of learning resources they have. So you might say to someone, okay, I'm going to put a, a bank of materials online, and you might choose to watch a presentation, you might choose to watch a video, you might choose to read a handout, but no matter which one you pick, you learn the same thing. So people are able to choose which path they go down, but they all reach the same destination. In addition to that, you also give people the ability online to collaborate together on, on something, to work on something together as a team, as if they were sat around a table working on something. And then the third, third and final thing you can get them to do is 
collaboratively give them joint assignments to do or, or, or tasks. So you can say to them, as a team, you're going to come together, you're going to learn about the content, you're going to discuss it, and then you're going to use those skills to solve a particular problem. So that's the kind of evolution, if you like, about where you can use technology to enhance teaching and learning. However, to go from here to here to here will typically take an average person, a normal, well-balanced person who has a life, around about two to three years. Okay? Because the idea is you need to try this with your delegates, in your training sessions, and figure out what does and also what doesn't work for you. Because there will be some things that you think, actually, that's not for me, that didn't work for me, it's not relevant to the kind of my style or delegates I have or the content I'm trying to impart. So what I want to do is essentially tell you the story of how this particular trainer here can get his content or her content, let's say to him, say to him because there's no hair, um, let's say get his content online, okay? So I'm going to make some assumptions and the first thing I'm going to assume is that all of you as trainers have content that might be typed up somewhere. Could be a Word document, could be a PDF file, but typically you might print this out and you might hand it out to people in a training environment. Yeah? No? Maybe? Yeah? Okay. So this is just lifted from Wikipedia, but if you imagine, don't worry about the actual content of the thing, if you imagine this is one of your handouts that you've currently got. And let's say, for example, you want to get this online. You want to start using kind of technology. The first thing you need to do like I say, is get it online. Now, there's lots of different ways you can do this, but one of the easiest ways is to use something called Google Sites. Google Sites is a free service. It's offered by Google, and it allows anyone to make any number of websites that they wish. And those websites could be online shops, they could be photograph albums, they could be uh, uh, learning portfolios, but equally, they could be a website which has training resource materials on there. So that's what this particular trainer uh, decides to do. He says, okay, I'm going to sign up for Google Sites. It's completely free of charge. Signs up. Takes about two minutes to sign up. <coughs> and then he takes the text that was on his handout and he pastes it into the Google Sites. So now what we have is the training materials are now online. So we haven't actually done anything to them per se. It's just the same text. But this means that anyone in the world who has the link can access this content on any web-enabled device. It works on phones, games consoles, computers, tablets. In terms of the security, when you set one of these things up, you have three, three options. Option number one, it's a publicly available website, just like Amazon or Tesco or something. Option number two, it's only available to people who you give the link to. So they haven't got to sign in, but you have, you have to essentially give them a ticket and go, you can come in. Option number three is you can have these things locked down to individual users. Therefore, if you have a model whereby people are paying for a particular training course and you have their email address, you can say, right, I'm going to give that email address the permission to access this site and only they can log in and using their email and password. The, the other nice thing about it is you, it, it's not all or nothing. You can actually have a website where parts of it are public, parts of it have this ticket system, and parts of it are private. So you, you, it, it's not one or, or nothing. You can actually find control exactly what you, what you show or what you don't show. So, so yes, yeah, so the website's online, uh, but it looks a bit bland. I want to make it look a bit more pretty. I want to you know, make it a bit more visually appealing. So what he can then do is think, okay, I'm going to put some pictures in. He wants to add some images into his website. Now, the problem with images on the internet is this. And you've, I don't know if you've done it. I certainly have is uh, when I used to be a teacher, I need to find an image. Go onto Google Images and I'll type in what I want and I'll just grab the first thing that comes up and I'll stick that in my hand out and bosh, I'm off and it's all good. The second you start to put that online though, you might be in a little bit of a, a sticky situation because the image might be copyrighted. So the challenge is then, well, how can you find images that aren't copyrighted? Now, there's a thing called Creative Commons. This is a special search engine. It's the Creative Commons search engine. What Creative Commons basically <coughs> says is this. It lets creators license their, their materials, license their works, for free to the public, provided whoever's using that material meets certain requirements. And the requirement usually is you've got to give credit. So you've got to say, oh, I've got this photo from Joe Bloggs, and here's Joe Bloggs' website, or something like that. That's normally the, the first one. The second one usually is if you change the image, you have to release the changed work under the same license that the original one 
was released under. So it's called like a share and share alike license. So you can't take something, tweak it slightly, and then start charging for it. So that's what we can do. So we, if we were to go onto this Creative Commons search engine, we type in the word kittens at the top, we can then choose from whatever search engine we want to use. In this particular example, we're going to use something called Flickr, which is a, an online uh, kind of photographic repository. And here are just some of the thousands of pictures tagged with the word kitten that people have photographed and released under the Creative Commons license. So you can use these, no problem at all. So what our trainer then does, he says, well, okay, I'm going to scroll through these and have a look and see what I can find. And he finds this one. He thinks that's quite nice. Cute little cat. Now what he's got to do, check out the license. The license conditions are shown here. So he can click on that on his computer to see what the conditions are of him using this. And this is what will appear. It's in plain English. There's no legalese about it. It's really, really nice and easy to understand. So for this particular picture, our trainer can copy it, he can copy it, he can share it, he can display it, he can make derivative works of it, so he can change his image if he wants to, he can edit it to suit his own purposes. He can even use it commercially, provided he does these two things here. Number one, he has to give the original person credit who took the original photograph. Number two, like I said before, has to share any derivative work, has to be shared under the same license. So he thinks to himself, well, that's fair enough. I can use that. That's not a problem at all. So that's what he does. But then he says to himself, well, hang on a second. This license says I can make derivative works in it. I can tweak this. So the challenge then is, well, how can I edit this photograph in the simplest and easiest way possible? And so what he decides to use is another free site called PicMonkey. PicMonkey is a completely free website, and it lets you edit photographs for free and then save the resulting photograph back onto your computer, and you can then use that on your website. So that's what he does. He uploads the photograph of the kitten. He applies a, po a Polaroid frame to it. He adds some little text to it. And he's then able to save that image, that changed image, onto his computer. Once he's saved it onto his computer, he's then free to upload it to the website. And the process of uploading to the website is as simple as you go to the website and you go, I want to insert something. And it says, what do you want to insert? You say, I want to insert a picture. It says, okay, where is the picture? You go, it's on my desktop. Done. Very, but there's no coding at all. There's no kind of technical wizardry, but it's, it's very much like a sticker album. You're just kind of sticking stuff everywhere. So that's what he's got so far. And the important thing here now is we've got the, the photograph, but because it was under Creative Commons, he's put... The original, who took the photograph originally and the license that it was shared by. And as long as he's got those two things there, he's absolutely fine. No legal problems at all. Okay, so we've got some pictures. And then I try anything to himself, well, okay. I now, I've got some pictures. I quite like to add in some sound. And the, the, the rules for sound are pretty much the same as the rules for images. So you have to find music that you can use legally. Fortunately, there's this website here called the Free Music Archive. And the Free Music Archive is, a, is, a, is a, a community hub with thousands upon thousands of audio tracks that artists have uploaded. And they've said, you can use these under Creative Commons again. So it's exactly the same as the, as the, as the photographs. And um, the same rules apply. So you can edit these things. Uh, you can, in some cases, you can, you can actually use them for commercial purposes, provided you meet those Creative Commons licenses. And each license will depend, each license varies from track to track. So you can go there if you want to find music. If you want to edit the music, you may have heard of Audacity before. It's been doing the rounds for a good 10 years now. Um, it's a free music editor, and it works on everything. Windows computers, Mac computers. Um, and it, essentially, it, it shows you the, what's called the waveform, so it gives you like a graphical representation of the sound, and then you can take an imaginary pair of scissors and start making cuts and edits and tweaks to it. <clears throat> That's quite sophisticated, though. But it is free. If you don't want to download a piece of software, you can use this. This is a free online web-based sound editor. So it works on any computer with an internet connection. Because what we tend to find is certainly at the, at the university we work at, and I work a lot with schools as well, is they'll go, well, I haven't got the admin rights to install this software onto my computer. So we'll be like, okay, that's fine. Just point your web browser to here, and it does exactly the same job. And the nice thing about this particular website is 
it comes with a free library of thousands of ready-made jingles and what's called stingers and uh, kind of foliage sound effects. So if you do want to kind of add anything extra into your recording, you can do. You can just as well, actually, just if you've got a microphone, you can just speak into the microphone and record your voice. So it allows you to get into podcasting if you want to in a, in a relatively straightforward way. But those two are quite sophisticated. In my experience, what, when people want to do audio, what they really just want, maybe, is just some, an audio of maybe them speaking about something. So if you want that, this is a lovely little website, and it just does it. No frills, but it does it. You go here, you have your microphone, if you've got a laptop that's built in anyway, hit the record button, speak. When you finish speaking, you press stop, and hit save. It then saves your voice as an MP3 file to your computer. And you can then distribute that as, as you wish. So that's what this particular trainer decides to do. He's like, well, okay, I've, I've got my, my text is on the screen. I'm going to read this text out for people who don't want to read it or can't read it or whatever. I'll put that as a sound file on the page. So that's what he does using this. And then we have this thing here. So now we have the text from our handout. We've got the image, which is under Creative Commons. And we've got this little built-in MP3 player, which is part of Google Sites, by the way. It's the same thing. You go, insert. What do you want to insert? A sound. Where's the sound? Right. And it looks after the player for you. And so now if you were to visit this page, you could click on the play button, and you'd hear the MP3 that's been recorded from this website here. And I stress, all of this is free. No money has been spent at all at this point in time. Next thing we're going to do is videos. Video is a little bit different to sounding images because... You've got things like YouTube. Now, YouTube's great. YouTube basically has the, starts from a position of, it, want, it assumes if someone uploads a video to YouTube, they want you to share their video. So if you wanted, say, to put the trailer for, I don't know, The Avengers on your site, you could do that because Marvel and Disney have uploaded that trailer to YouTube and they have said, we're totally cool with people embedding it. If you can embed a YouTube video, then it's fine. I.e., if, if the functionality exists for you to do it and you do it, you won't get into trouble. Having said that, though, there are lots and lots and lots of videos out there. So I'm just going to show you a couple of sites that you might be more interested in as, as opposed to just, you know, Charlie bit my finger or a dancing cat or something. There's this one here, which is YouTube slash EDU. This is the educational wing of YouTube. And so what they do is they scoop up all of the educational videos. Many of them are being produced by the world's top universities, and they're all in this one place. And so the nice thing about this is you can do a search in YouTube, but just on this channel. So you say, I'm going to search for a certain word, and I only want videos that <clears throat> YouTube deems to be of educational worth. That's one thing you can do. The other thing you might want to do is have a look at TED.com. They hold an annual conference every year. They get the world's leading thinkers and doers. So uh, people like, I don't know, Brian Cox, for example, uh, are regular TED speakers. So they, uh, but what they will do is they will film all of these talks and they release one new talk every single day about a particular topic. So there's all sorts of stuff on there, but you might find something that's relevant to what you're training people on. Or, or you can say, well, we haven't got time to cover it here, but there's an interesting talk. You can watch it online if you want to. However, you might... <laughs> you might want to record your own video. Now, time was, that was a bit of a faff, but these days it's not. If you have a YouTube account, which by the way, YouTube is owned by Google, so if you've got a Google Sites account, you've got a YouTube account, it's the same thing. You can go to YouTube's upload, uh, record from uh, webcam feature, and sit in front of your computer, and hit the record button, and just speak. And it will film you. And when you finish speaking, you hit stop. And it uploads that video to YouTube, which you can then share with other people. It also works if you have delegates that have got like things like smartphones and stuff. You can say, let's say you're having a particular discussion, you can say, well, if you're, as long as they're happy with that, you, know, you can film this thing and have that discussion uploaded to YouTube. And with YouTube videos, they, the same security settings on YouTube videos are the same as the Google Sites one. So they can be public, they can be available to only people who give you the ticket to, or they can be available only to people who you name. So it's possible for you to film a group discussion and have that group discussion on YouTube, but only accessible to people who you say can access it. Of course, there is nothing stopping that person, you're trusting that person, 
saying, well, I'm going to show everyone else, but the same would apply for any kind of teaching or training materials that you choose to give to people. In my experience, though, not many people are keen on that. Something that they are quite keen on, though, is something called a screencast. You might, I, again, I don't know how useful this is to yourselves. We have, uh, let's say you want to show your, your delegates how to do something on a computer. Might be use a particular piece of software, might be just how to use a particular health and safety website or how you get important documents off or whatever it might be. This particular website here lets you make videos of your computer screen and it records your voice. So the idea is afterwards people can see what you saw on your screen, they can see your mouse moving around and everything, and they can hear your voice over the top. So you can make instructional how-to videos talking them through how they do a particular thing. Again, it's completely free, and the videos that you make can be automatically uploaded to YouTube so that they can then be shared or locked down as you see fit. But it's all completely free of charge. So a lot of the stuff that we work with uh, when they're supporting learners a lot of the things we need to show them on the computer, they just need to remember, but they forget. So they get asked again and again and again and again and again. It drives them up the wall. So what they do is they say, right, we're going to make these videos. And then, then they say, if you've got any questions, watch that video. If you've watched the video and you don't understand it, then come to me. And as a result, we see the, the kind of the inquiries about the, the routine tasks drop off so that the, the educators can spend more time on those challenges which actually require their attention rather than how to open a file or out of a download this document or you know, whatever it might be. Regardless of which one you decided to do, whether it be one of these screencasts, a video of yourself, or a video you grabbed from TED or YouTube or anywhere else, you can insert that video into your Google site really easily. You should go, insert, what do you want to insert? I want to insert a video. It says, okay, where is the video? It's on YouTube, right, done. And then it puts the video here for you, get the player, people can just watch that video anytime they want to. So, so far, we've done, uh, we've got a website, we've added some images in, we've put some sound effects in, we've put the video in. What I want to do now is look at how you can add PowerPoints in, because I would be willing to bet that some of you at least have some PowerPoints that you show, maybe on a fairly regular basis, and maybe you get people requesting that you distribute PowerPoints to them. Maybe they bring USB sticks in and say, can I have a copy of that, or whatever it might be. The problem with PowerPoint is that PowerPoint was built in a pre-internet era. It lends itself very well to having a machine like this running a presentation with a projector. It doesn't lend itself very well to creating content that can be accessed on, say, games consoles or tablets or smartphones. It assumes that people are going to have Microsoft Office on their computer. And nowadays, that's probably not the case. Most people access the internet on other devices. But we don't want to do away with PowerPoint because we've got all this cool stuff on it. So, what you can use is this thing called Google Docs. And again, if you've got a Google Sites account, it's the same thing. It's another facet of this one account. So you've got your Google site, your YouTube, and this. And what this lets you do is, amongst other things, it lets you take a PowerPoint that you've made, drag, literally drag it from a desktop and drop it into a special window. It will then convert that PowerPoint for you to a web-friendly format which means people can view your presentation as you originally intended, but it will work from within a web browser, which means they can view it on a smartphone, on a games console, on a tablet, and on a computer without having to pay for Microsoft Office to be installed. And because it's web-based, if you want to embed it into your Google site, you can do just like the video. You've got to go, I want to embed a presentation. Here's a presentation, and it puts it in for you. Sometimes, though, you might not want to make a presentation. Sometimes you might think, well, actually, I wonder if I can nick something from somewhere else. And there's a place where you can do that legitimately. It's called SlideShare. Lovely website. This is basically YouTube, but for the PowerPoint generation. And this allows people to upload all sorts of presentations. And then you can re-embed them if you want to. In some cases, you can edit them. Depends on the, the, the permissions people have given you. But also, so what we're going to do, our particular trainer here, he thinks, OK, fine. I'm feeling a bit lazy, I don't really want to make a presentation on kittens, I'll see if one exists already. So he types in the word kitten into the search box just up here. And then when he does that, he finds a whole load of presentations that return to him. So what he then does, he says, well, hang on a second, I know in my handouts I talk about the development of kittens, so maybe, maybe this might be useful, this top one. So he clicks on it to have a look. And he can then preview that presentation within the web browser. No need to download it. No need to install anything, it just works. You see here, we've got the ability to embed. 
that whoever created this presentation has said, it's fine, you can embed this, no problem at all. No need to ask permission, you can just do it legally, no bother. So that's what he does. He's able to go up to Google Sites and say, I want to insert a presentation. And he's then able to take the presentation found on SlideShare and just pop it straight in. Something else has happened now, though. Whereas before we had one page with everything on, what's happened now is that our trainer has actually separated it. He had one handout made with a couple of subheadings on. He started to separate the content out. So, the, so what Google does is builds an automatic menu for you over here. So the first page we were looking at is the introduction. That's still there. But he's now made a second page called Birth and Development and put some notes in here. So it, rather than being just a one-page thing, we now have a two-page website with an automatic navigation menu. He hasn't got to do that, does it for him, that lets delegates choose which content they want to look at by using that menu on the side. Last thing, testing understanding. There are lots and lots and lots of different ways you can do this. Some people you know, will have multiple choice quizzes. Some people have some activities, that kind of thing. When you start getting into using technology, though, there is uh, something quite nice you can do using games. This is a lovely site here called classtools.net, and what this lets you do is make games. The idea is you can type in some questions with the answers, and these might already be questions that you've had traditionally on a piece of paper that you may be asked. So you can just copy and paste them if you want to. And the question and the answers are separated by the little asterisks. And once you've put those in, you can then choose from a whole number of different templates to make a game. Now, I was a child of the 80s. Um, I cut my teeth on a Spectrum 48K, and the game of choice was called Manic Miner. This website lets you make Manic Miner, but test people's knowledge and understanding. For those of you who aren't familiar with Manic Miner, this is the protagonist here. His, his name is Miner Willy. The 80s were a more innocent time. Um, and essentially what happens is you have a limited amount of time before your air runs out, you have to navigate the level, and you have to jump into the answers that respond, uh, correspond to the questions which are shown below. And the answers are moving around. Get three answers right, a toilet appears, you jump into the toilet, you're on to level two. I don't make this up. All right? But if you don't like that, there's lots and lots of other game templates you could use with the same question set. But it basically means that you can, if you want, to say, well, I'm going to show you something for in our face-to-face -face sessions. But if you want to test your knowledge and understanding, you can do so using these little games. And again, because it's all embeddable, um, we're able to put that actually into, this is the Google site. I've got my navigation here now, I've got a couple more pages. One of the pages is called Test Your Knowledge. I've got the game there that, that just works, so people can play it on their computers with sound effects and all sorts of stuff. So this is the, this is the conveyor belt. So the idea is, is we've gone from having uh, notes that were printed out on a piece of paper, or use several free tools to essentially create this website. But this isn't a theoretical website. This website actually exists. You can visit it if you want to. It's live right now. Um, the web address is that thing there. If you have your a QR code, you can scan the QR code in. It'll take you there as well. We'll circulate this afterwards, so it's not a problem. But the other thing I wanted to show you very quickly, um, and this is the nice thing about Google Sites, this is what the website will look like if it's, if it's viewed on a, a computer, a laptop, say. But if the same website is viewed on a smartphone, what Google automatically does is convert it so it's mobile-friendly. In essence, it lets you make smartphone apps for free. So you can just have your content in one place and know that no matter what that individual uses to look at the content, it will automatically adapt itself to the most uh, appropriate format, should we say. And that's it. Um, I hope I've given you some uh, things to think about. Um, the, the main thing is, these are just, this is just a small sample of what's out there. I mean, you know, I, I tend to finish up, it, it literally is the tip of the iceberg. So if you want to know more about this kind of stuff, I've got my own little website, it's completely free of charge, and it has all of the free tools on there. This web address here, this is the Cardiff Safe one, this will take you to uh, a special web page on my site which has the presentation. <coughs> it will also have the video with the audio that I've been doing now, and it's got links to absolutely all of the resources that I've shown as well. So if, if you want to check it out, you please, uh, feel free.